Hello, everyone. Um, I would say good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are. This is Joseph Trevisani from Worldwide Markets. We're going to do something, to those of you who have been to my webinars before, we're going to do something a little different. Um, normally, I give rather theoretical, macro-based, fundamental, tinged analyses. Um, most historical but primarily of macro trends and what you have to be aware of when you participate in the foreign exchange markets. However, that is very much an economist's purview. I am not an economist, although, as I've said many times to friends of mine, I play one on television on occasion. Um, my... Education background is an English major and also in graduate school, uh, finance and economics. But 15 years, starting in um, 1988, late 1988, although that doesn't make much difference at this point, does it? Um, I was a foreign exchange trader for Credit Suisse, both in New York and in Singapore, and for the Bank of Bermuda in Hamilton, Bermuda. If anyone is looking for a honeymoon destination, I would recommend, and you live on the east coast of the United States, I would certainly recommend Bermuda. It's a very unusual and very beautiful place. When I was trading, and of course I started out as a complete neophyte, I guarantee you that the day I sat on a Credit Suisse trading desk the first time, I know far less than you do right now. I knew far less than you did when you begun, began trading or began being interested in trading. And the reason is quite simple. You have chosen this, if not profession, this endeavor. You didn't choose it because you needed a job. You chose it for various reasons, but all of which probably involved investigating the market, how the markets work, how you can approach it, what you have to do to participate. When I went to work at Credit Suisse, I needed a job, and I was probably less than discriminate in the job that I saw. At the time, my only real connection to the markets um, was through their psychology. Um, I'd always been fascinated by cultural phenomenon, by psychological cultural phenomenon, if you will. I was a great reader of uh, many times, actually, um, Isaac Asimov's early series called The Foundation. I'm not giving a literary lecture here, but there's a concept in there called psychohistory. In, and what that means is that that would be used by academics to actually mean something. But what he meant in that was that the futures, the responses of a enormous mass of people, billions and billions, can be reduced to a statistical sum. Of course, this is not true currently, but one could imagine how this could be true, even if it's not true now. I have always taken the same type of approach to trading once I figured out what it was, and that took a couple of years. For me, the approach to trading is a psychological approach. After all, I've written on this a number of times. Um, and one of my columns is called The Market is Mass Mind. <laughs> That's actually the, and a concept from another early science fiction novel, Arthur C. Clarke, called uh, The City and the Stars. You find this concept quite common in science fiction, where I see it on Star Trek many times, where each little each entity is part of a greater whole. And the whole is what comes at come the participation of all of these individuals is what makes the decision. To my mind, markets work very much like that. We are all participating nodes with our decisions, our trading decisions, in the outcome of the market, which at any one time <coughs> excuse me, is price. This is how I could approach the markets. I mean, you know, to find, to be successful 
at trading is not an easy thing. I'll talk about more about that in a minute, but we want to do the trade setups here. I'm not going to give a thoroughly and completely theoretical lecture and end up, you know, somewhere around Alpha Centauri, so nobody will actually know what I'm talking about. The reason I stress psychology is because it is important, I feel, to remember that what you are seeing in price action is not some ethereal creature called the market that we're attempting to understand. The market is all of us. I've used this phrase many times. It's from an old cartoon strip. I'm sure you've heard it into my um, webinars before. We have met the market and he is us. Um, the original phrase, of course, is we have met the enemy and he is us. Concepts are not all that different considering what we're trying to do. Your decision process, choosing trades, choosing stops and limits, when to initiate, when to get out, is identical to everyone else in the market, or almost everyone else in the market. When we're talking about the type of trading we're going to go into right here, position trading, looking at charts, looking at possible setups, putting our initiation order in, putting our stops and limits in, that's the biggest bulk of trading. Um, the other kind of trading is flow trading. It's not done as much anymore. It's what I used to do with Credit Suisse. It's where your job is to both make prices for the market as a market maker. Credit Suisse was a market maker in Deutschmarks and Swiss francs and in the Mark Swiss Krauss and heavily heavy participants in sterling, in the yen, and what used to be the mark yen, and in all of the European crosses. In 1988, there was no ERM. There was no euro, there were, you know, three dozen, little, not two dozen little currencies across Europe, all of which could be traded against each other. I remember one time we had on a 200 million Belgian franc, Swiss franc position, trying to get prices, and that was a little difficult. The point of all of these crosses was that every one of them could be traded um, against each other. So you would look at a much greater variety in those days in currencies to look for for particular trade setups. So what we would do, especially when I was working for the Bank of Bermuda, when I was at Credit Suisse, we were flow traders, meaning it was our job as traders to make prices for the markets, customers coming in, prices for us. And whenever there was a – we thought there was a move coming or we had a large customer. So if I made prices in Swiss francs and one of my Swiss customers comes in and asks for a price in – 300 million or 200 million or even 50 million dollar Swiss, that means 50 million dollars in the U.S. against Swiss, I make him a price. If he deals, or she, but mostly it was men, then I know very likely that the market's going to move in that direction. So if I make him 25, 30 in a hundred million dollar Swiss franc, a hundred million dollar Swiss, he's going to pay me 30. I have to go out and buy a hundred million dollar Swiss in the market. I know that when I do that, I'm going to push the market up. So as a trader, as a flow trader, your job is to make money on that. Well, how do you do that? You're not long beforehand because he just came in for the price. What you do is you usually go with it. So if he pays me for a hundred million dollar Swiss, I will then go out and buy 120 or 130 million dollar Swiss and ride that 30, because after all, nobody else knows in the market what I'm doing, but can generate movement. Because how did you cover in those days? You would go out. I would have my assistants. I would say, you know, prices in $10 Swiss, they would get 10 or 15 prices coming to me, and I would pay them. I would buy from other banks in the market. That's why I cover my position. So that's full trading. You still see that on occasion. Sometimes there will, you have to excuse me, but my mouse is less than cooperative. You will see that. I'll see if I can find some examples from here, but I didn't line up. And you will see that. Sometimes for inexplicable reasons, you will see the market move 50 points. There's no statistics. There's no discernible trade point. There's no formation. There's nothing that we're looking at. There's no supportive resistance being broken. The market just moves, especially if you see that move only in one currency. Most likely what's happening is 
that somebody did exactly what I just described. They came in and they bought or sold a certain amount of currencies. Those people then have to go out and pay the market, it drives the market, or they sell the market, goes out in one direction or another. But most of the time, especially now, because the flow trading aspect centered in the money market banks has gone away. It's not completely gone away, but it's largely gone away. The reason it was successful, the reason it existed was because the sent the money market banks knew where the prices were. They were connected by a private dealing system called uh, Reuters. And uh, before that, even before before that, before Reuters and EBS, they were connected by voice, voice brokers. There were no electronic dealing systems, only the direct dealing systems. So I could call Goldman Sachs for a price, but I couldn't put my price into the market except with the voice brokers. That has pretty much gone away now. Everybody knows where the market is. If you want to know where the market is, you go to the WW website, you download a demo, and that will tell you what 15 years ago only a few thousand traders around the world, or probably less at any one time, knew exactly where the market is. So the idea of being able to surprise the market, move the market, create volatility is much less than it used to be. So the flow aspect of the business is much smaller. On the other hand, the volume in daily traded foreign exchange keeps going up. Probably two things are, are at, at play there. One, I think primarily, is that the Internet has given so many more people, not just retail traders, all sorts of mid-sized hedge funds, all sorts of things, access to the market. So people can go out, get connected to the market, and trade away. Um, you know, the ability to make trading profits, which – the old Dire Straits song, Money for Nothing, um, can be a great incentive, especially now in the age of central bank financial repression, where you can't earn any money anyplace else. It's very difficult. So people um, who, whose job it is to make profits, to beat the street, to beat the market, to beat their competitors, as far as returns go, are very hard-pressed as to where to go to at least potentially make market beating PL and foreign exchange to those places. So we have that change taking place. So with the decline of flow trading and the rise, I think, of position trading, what we all do of technically based positions. Well, if you are, this is the 60-minute chart. Let's get a little, a little bit more up. I'm going to start with the euro. I'm going to go through everything um, as far as trade subs go. What you know, this I'm, well, I'm going to do something unusual. Well, at least for me. Um, let's see if we can get. Okay, this is 90 minutes on the 90 days on the 60-minute chart. I'm going to try and duplicate what I would have done, what I did do when I was working for the Bank of Bermuda, when I was largely a prop trader. The Bank of Bermuda didn't really have any flow business. We had a big customer. And he blew up in a spectacular fashion one evening. I think I did probably two and a half billion dollars worth of trades with this one guy that evening. <laughs> it was an interesting evening to say the least. It lasted well into the next day. Um, and uh, it didn't come out very well for the customer. Um, he was wrong in the markets. Um, and that was huge flow trading. Huge flow. He was coming in and paying me for two, three hundred million euro, euro yen at a time. And um, we just whipped the market around that day. From a little bank down in Bermuda, I mean, relatively speaking, it's a big custody bank. But as far as exchange goes, they were not a large uh, a large player uh, until we started dealing with this customer. But anyway, after that, as a prop trader, your job is to make P&L. You sit down at your desk. Either if I was working, I used to trade the Tokyo ship sometimes because I would come in. I would come in as a trader, as a prop trader. You're looking for any advantage you can. What you're trying to do is improve your odds. That's all. You're not trying to be right every time. It's a guaranteed loser. Now, I will talk a little bit at the end about the most crucial fact about trading, and that's money management. But initially, before you can manage your P&L, you have to have some, P or L. And in order to have some, you've got to take a position. So what I would do, now, I'm starting cold here. 
um, I'm sure all of you and I did too, had much longer, a series of longer running charts. I would have charts set up with formations in var- with, with various chart formations and various resistance lines um, that would run. So I'd come in every day and the charts would automatically update. Um, this was Aspen Graphics, I think. Um, very similar to, it looks, it looked actually very similar to the Bloomberg charts we're using here. But what I want to do for the people who are in attendance here is actually go through the thought process of setting up everything of what I would look for. Now I'm going to do this using traditional bar charting techniques. Uh, this is a candle chart because that candles actually have a little more information than bars. But the formations that I'm going to be using are primarily visual bar charting formations. Um, you can do the same thing with candle charts. Their terminology is different, and some of the things that they look for are different, but they use, of course, the same information. And by and large, they come exactly to the same conclusions. Um, the godfather, I guess, of candle charting, Steve Nissen in candle charts, um, and I've been to a number of his lectures and his webinars, and I think he's very good, um, will always say, Candle charting is one tool. You should confirm your observations and your analysis with as many tools as possible. What he meant was that if you look at a particular trade setup in candle charts, then do two more things. Confirm it, and this is a belief of mine as well, long before I knew Steve Nissen. Um, Confirm it across other time frames, and then confirm it across other tools. Specifically, he meant traditional bar charting and bar charting formations. So let's take a look. When I would start, we're going to start with Euro. Now remember, my approach, and this is not everyone's approach, but this is my approach, perhaps because of my background. Um, my approach to charting is almost is somewhat of a feedback loop. Charts work because people think that they work and because people base their actions on what they see in the charts. I used to, I call I think I wrote a paper one time called it you may even be able to find it on I think you find it on our website. The psychological utility of charting. And what I mean is we have start with a few assumptions. One assumption, and probably the primary assumption, that everybody else in the markets is trying to do exactly the same thing we are, make trading profits. Two, they're using exactly the same information that we have, meaning the price information on the charts. Three, they're using the same analytical tools, primarily chart formations, whether they are traditional or bar charts, support resistance lines, and indicators. We all use the same set of assumptions, of information, and analytical tools. Therefore, what we're attempting to predict is not quite, and, and I stress this because I think it's a way of entering into what you're doing. It's a different way to think about it. At least, I think it's a different way to think about it. Traditionally, people look at charts and say, And the shorthand is the euro and the market. The euro did this. The market did that. Neither one is true. The euro has no volition. The market does not exist in a cavern underneath Wall Street and send up signals about what to do, surprising everyone. Both of those entities act and react because of you and I, because of actions that are taken by traders in the market. And remember our assumptions, trading profits, information, prices, and analytical tools are all the same. So what, you, what you're doing, what you're really doing is attempting to predict and participate in the thought process of other traders as mediated, delineated by chart techniques primarily. Remember, price history bears no relation, 
as the phrase goes from, you know, brokerages and other financial products companies, past performance is no guarantee of future success. And in fact, unfortunately, or for trading, because it's very difficult, past performance is usually a guarantee, can be a guarantee of future difficulties. Because trading is a very difficult endeavor. So, with that behind us, as far as how I look at the interaction between you as the trader sitting at your screen and, quote, the market as a whole. My approach, as I've said, is to realize or is try to keep in front of me that all I'm doing and attempting to do is predict the reactions of other traders. So we're trying to do exactly the same thing. So let's start. If I was coming in to the Bank of Bermuda in Hamilton, so I was trading the afternoon shift, which is my favorite, because I would start about 4 o'clock. That means I could spend the prior few hours on the beach. It was a very good gig in Hamilton. It didn't last very long, about two years. Um, but it was a fun a fun way to work. I felt like I was in some sort of – well, I never thought of Bermuda that way, but I certainly thought of California or Hawaii that way. You know, you get up in the morning, you do what you do, you go to the beach, you do a little surfing. I didn't surf. And then you go to work for a few hours, and you go home and entertain yourself. But we'll leave that. I used to always start, and I'll give you my logic, with an hourly chart. Because our focus is intraday trading. When we can find and utilize longer-term trends because they coincide with something or because we simply find them, that's good. But many times the price movement intraday is divorced or distant, shall we say, from any longer-term trends or any longer-term decision points. So I would usually start with an hourly chart. So right here we have an hourly chart in the euro, 60 minutes. We're going to put it out to the Longest definition we can. I'm not sure this will do it. Let's see if we can get six months on this thing. No, it's not giving us, it's not giving us six months, unfortunately. And I'm not sure why that is. This is Bloomberg, as I said. Okay, well, anyway, let's start. So, we know what this line is here. That's the Fed decision on the 18th. Surprise everybody. No taper. Okay. Irrelevant largely to our discussion today, except for the fact that it's a great example of why you should always use stops. Everybody in creation, except for like two people, expected the Fed to start tapering. I did too. I wrote a paper or a piece two days before, six reasons why the Fed will taper. I still stand by the logic, but they didn't do it. The reason everyone expected it to is because the entire discussion about tapering was started by the Fed. May 22nd, when Bernanke passed off what appeared to be just a little comment, and of course it was very calculated, that perhaps the Fed would start easing, uh, would start easing up on the gas pedal, if you will, all the metaphors that you run across every single day for a 100 times, financial journalism, um, would lighten up a bit on the taper or no, excuse me, would lighten up on the amount that they were pumping into the system, the quantitative easing every day, and begin to taper it off. They started that conversation. Nobody asked them to. Nobody expected them to. They started it. He then confirmed it again on the 19th and then retracted it pretty much on July 10th. But it remained in the price level, although not a huge amount. Take a look at the, take a look at the, the daily level here. Okay, these are the dailies in the euro. May 22nd, right around here. Okay, look what the euro did, straight up. Okay, market at that point was not paying attention to Mr. Bernanke. He said May 22nd, right here, that we may start ta- we may taper off on QE. Martin, the euro didn't care didn't care about it. The credit market did, but the euro did not. Um, that's a column that I think I'm going to write this week. Um, Anyway, guess what date that is? The 19th. That's when the Fed, at the end of that FOMC, seemed to confirm the 
intention to begin to taper. And where are we down here? Oh, we don't have to guess this. July 10th. When the Fed seemed to pull that back, that they were going to taper. Now, the interesting part about this move is that we were from went from 34 down to 28. And when the Fed seemed to pull back on the idea of tapering on the twenty, now you should always keep in mind when you're doing in your background the fundamental aspects of what's going on. That's why I'm going to do this right now. Then we'll approach the because what that gives you the coloration, that gives you the benefit of the doubt which way that you're likely to go in a currency. And you need as much information as possible. But it's difficult to trade fundamental trends because you can't operate on decision points, inception points, except on rare occasions, based on fundamental information. So right here, there's no way that anyone here, say you were short from here, because if the Fed is going to taper, this is anticipation. But if they really do start to taper, it was my opinion that this would continue. You would not have had buy the rumor and sell the fact, but it would have continued, especially if they did more. So if you were short here and you hadn't put a stop in, you got killed. I'll repeat this many times today. Always use stops. It's easier to start over than it is to start hoping and praying it comes back the way. It never does. And if it does, it costs you too much emotionally, and you can't trade that way. So the 10th, it turns around, we go back up here. But the return only went back to, of course, 134. 134 remain the top, largely. These things don't count. You have to be completely accurate on this until we get right here. So with that background, right, this is going back a year, actually more. It's a year, sorry. So from February pretty much on, 134 was the top. Now, we need that as background because it's going obviously to plug into our our charts. So this is our – let's see if I can get a little bit longer time frame on this. We'll do – so we can get get six months on the four-hour chart. Okay, this gives us six months on the four-hour chart. It's not as it's not as uh, we'll go back. So, looking for chart formations. Let's go back. We know what's here now. I just want to make sure we we'll go back to the sixty, the sixty minute, which is where I would normally start. Because in my view, and this is my particular view, uh, remember, charting, although it has a lot of tools in common, the interpretation has a lot of basics, but people have two things. They have their own preference as far as particular pictures, charting formations. They also have their own preference when it comes to indicators and many of the tools. My general approach to charting, aside from the psychological aspect that I've already spoken about, is to think of all of the various tools, indicators, support and resistance lines, astrology. You know, there is a a school of astrological prediction in the stock market. I've never seen it applied to currencies. And every once in a while, um, I guess for humorous case for most of us, um, somebody will trot out an astrological predictor. And what they find is that, you know, It's not all that different than what more scientific types of charting are able to predict as far as the uh, movement of various markets. But anyway, so I would start at the hourly. Now, the way I look at various tools is this. Um, The general picture, I'm going to draw a chart line here, and the reason I'm using Bloomberg is because it, I'm very familiar. Now, this is an hourly. Very familiar with its charting functions. Okay, so there we have the first chart line drawn today. An uptrend going back to the first week in September. Not a lot of surprise there. But the way I would look at this and almost all other ones, these pictures, trend lines, support resistance, channels, pennants, and the equivalents in 
in uh, candle charting are, are, are adhered to or at least observed and looked at by almost everyone. So they have the widest audience. They have the widest sense of participation. So that's one group. Every other analytical tool think of as having its own particular audience. I mean, take these are the these are the studies on Bloomberg. Okay, so that would a very basic one, a moving average. I personally don't think moving averages are all that useful, but I will tell you that many people do. Okay, so we look at a very simple 14-day uh, moving average. Okay, right there. It doesn't tell us very much, but there are special on an hourly chart. So let's move back a little bit. And I'll, I'll, I have a point on this in one second. Oops, the wrong one right here. Okay. Mr. Bloomberg really does deserve his brilliance. I know I've made that observation before. Okay, so this is a 100-day moving average. Okay. Useful. Now, some people believe in crosses of the 200, the 100, or all sorts of things. But if you think about who's participating in each trade, each, after you get through the basic picture, such as trend lines, I'm going to do resistance and other things, um, you have different groups. So somebody will like trend lines and they'll like 100-day moving average. Somebody will like trend lines and RSI. Somebody will like any one of another zillion indicators. Each indicator that points in a similar way, um, suggesting a certain trade, becomes yet another group that is going to participate in that trade. This is true for chart formations, chart types, say candles and traditional bar indicators. It's also true for time frames. So the more different groups adhering to slightly different interpretations that you get lined up for a particular event, for a particular trade, the more people are going to participate, the more likely it's going to happen. So what I always would do is if I would look. Now, this is a very obvious. This particular trade setup right here. So let's get rid of this. Do, 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 do. That's no longer 100-day moving average. I can't remember. We're on, we're on one hourly charts. It's going back only to uh, we got about three months. Actually, it's 90 days. Okay, we can't get six months on it. So what else would I look for here? Well, Support and resistance lines, of course. Remember, what people are looking for, what traders are looking for, are reasons to trade and then reasons to take profit or cut losses. And they will make, you and I and everyone else, will make those determinations based on what's in front of us right here. So if you were looking for a base for this particular series of moves, this is pretty easy which is why it's probably not all that useful, meaning it's too obvious. But let's draw it anyway because it's important. Oh, come on, mouse. Sorry, this mouse just broke, said, broke, spoke to my tech guy. You know, this mouse is a little dicey. Okay, so we have it here. We're looking for the horizontal support line. So we could draw any one of these places. Right, we can connect you try to connect as many points as possible when you're doing this in bar charting. But in this case, I would say that the combination of these points here, this one, these through here, these here, and the fact that it's a round number. Round numbers, the way our brains are organized, um, generally have a little more sway than anything else. So, now this is no great... Support line here, 34 of the figure. It works, but one, we're nowhere near it, and two, 
it doesn't really have a lot of, shall we say, force in this area right here. Now, the fact that a surprise move by the Fed drove right through without, without a blink means absolutely nothing. Those kinds of developments will always and forever trump any particular charting level. Now, if we were looking for a channel here, let's, let's draw that. Where is the channel? Here it is. Okay, so we match this channel here. And then we put the parallel, okay? The parallel would have come, let's see, we're going to put it right here. See why I like Bloomberg charting, you get to you get to vary these around. So the channel would have come right here. Now, what we find here is that this channel has no relevance once we get this crash, once we get that move right there. So this channel, in this time period here, did have relevance. We more or less obeyed the, tr the, the channel there. But once we got up here, it doesn't really have any relevance. So as far as our current trading goes, I would say we can ignore that and we delete it. So it doesn't have any information there. So, so far here we have this very pronounced uptrend, which existed before Fed Surprise, but again, contained this time up until 134. And then we have this move up here and, and the, the fall off. Now, this move, of course, was prompted by a fundamental change in Fed policy. Now, we've had the Fed and its various spokesmen coming out again. I have a feeling I'm not going to get to all of these currencies. So if anyone wants a particular currency, um, please let me know. Let me just put up the, uh, the other chat here. Okay. Hold on a second here. Okay, I'm just I'm just looking here. Nissan does not trade, as far as I know. Uh, I, 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 you've been in my webinars before, you know. I like to answer questions through there. Uh, as far as the market view, you have to make it up yourself, or you can read anywhere. There's lots of there's lots of there's lots of forex journalism out there. We have it on our site and lots of other places. Um, more about Astro. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe I'll give a, uh, a webinar on science fiction. I used to write on science fiction. It's a lot of fun. I love science fiction. Anyway. Okay, let me finish Euro first, and then we will. Okay. I will not give a lecture on science fiction. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so right here, uh, so for the thought process here, all we have right here are the three, the three factors we have right here right now. This is all I'm going to deal with right now. Okay? We have... The fundamental change that I mentioned, you must keep that in mind. Um, you have the fact that the Fed is once again trying to talk back the what they've said. You had actually had Dudley out there today. He's one of been one of the big QE supporters of President of the New York Fed, saying, "Well, you know, we could still start tapering." What the Fed would like more than anything else right now is to be able to taper, to stop, to wind down their QE and have it have no interest rate effects at all. That's what they would like. They would like to be able to stop tapering and not have rates go up. This is crazy. can't happen. But that's what they would like. So every time, and we've seen this, and it's becoming to look like a deliberate policy, it's sort of like that, was that Oscar Wilde quote, to have one parent die, looks like coincidence. Uh, I forget. Two looks like oversight. Anyway, I forget. Um, so we may be seeing a policy where the Fed does this all the time. Um, they, they, they give a policy and they attempt to take it back so they don't get any movement in currencies, I mean, any movement in, in, in the credit rates. What's really clear to the Fed from the Fed's actions is that, that they are very afraid of, yes, but I can remember the exact quote. What they, it does cause my, I agree, but you know, I don't think the Fed cares a whole lot about the foreign exchange market. They do care about the foreign market. Um, what the Fed is very much afraid of is a rise in interest rates. Okay, let's finish this. Um, so right here we have this trend line, which I will almost guarantee is going to be respected. It's going to be tested. 
right here before we get on and we have this line here. Now, I'm not going to draw any other lines on this because it's always been my idea that, that you keep things relatively simple in charting and analysis and in, yes, I can. Um, and in how you trade, place your trade. So let's get a little closer look at this, okay, this area right here. So we need to go back to the 8th of September, so we're going to run 30 days on this. Okay, now we're going to draw the same line here. Okay, there to there. Okay, and then we have the 34 line here, which we can see now. One thing that's often true about moves like this, it's an old cliche from the markets, gaps will be filled. This is essentially a gap. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes, thank you very much. There's the quote. Uh, Mr. James, I thank you very much, and I will read it. To lose one parent may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. That has the, the essence of Mr. Wilde's witty shallowness. Every once in a while, he does have a quote that actually seems to mean something. Most of the time, it's all surface. That's definitely a surface quote, but thank you for that. I appreciate it. So we have two considerations. The logical point to place a trade here. The Fed may be attempting to talk back some of what it said on the last FOMC and the, the result in the market about uh, – not tapering because the market's too weak. Nevertheless, if you have to compare actions to conversation, then clearly you go with action. Mr. Dudley may have said, well, we can still do it. Yes, I suppose they still can. That's a true statement on the fact of it. They all, Of course they can still do it. But the likelihood of them actually doing it is very weak, especially when we get these numbers that are likely to come out between now and then. I haven't, I haven't read Wilde's plays since college. Although, I don't know if you're an American, I was watching an old Law & Order episode last night, and one of, the, uh, one of the characters gave a monologue from an, a play, which my wife knew, she identified it immediately for like, two cent, like half a sentence, called Night Mother, which I don't rem I remember the name, but I couldn't remember who wrote it. Anyway, sorry about that. Don't get me started on digressions because you know I like to digress. Um, the likely place to place a trade here is right here. And that would be some sort of bounce around this line. If we put the line today around 131, 34, 60 or so, um, you know, we did, it's probably a little bit less than that because there, I, I thought, you know, when I looked at the, the um, trade today, okay, 65. So it's a little bit lower. So the range here is about 134. We could say that the line is probably around 130 to Okay. And what did we see today? We saw a bounce so far at 65. Why, if the line is, say, at 50, we saw a bounce at 65? That's very obvious. Whenever you're attempting to place a trade, you've got to anticipate. As I said earlier, everybody... They're trying to do the same thing. This is a very obvious place to place a trade. That means two things. Everybody's going to do it. Three things. Everybody's going to do it, or many people are going to do it. Two, they're all going to try and jump it. And three, it's probably going to go that way. So if you're looking to place a trade and to go long based on this line, looking for an intraday bounce, then you're not going to place it at 50. You'd probably place it 15 points above. And where did the market go to? About 62. My guess is this bounce right here from we're on New York time, 8.30, the New York Open, how about that, was very much an anticipation of going along based on charting intraday pricing and intraday trading before this trend line. There's no surprise in that. Now, two other things are – because, uh, sorry about that, uh, I was got up a little bit. Um, because everyone is, as we can say, anticipating this trade going long right here. There's one other factor that's involved, of course. 
everybody who went long there is going to be looking to take profits. I don't think anyone is expecting this line to be a huge bounce. It only goes back to the 6th, and it only goes back to, uh, to early September. And it they is based largely on something outside of technical trading. So that means all of these people here who are long are going to be inclined if there's not a strong movement upward, and there hasn't been. We're only back at 90 to take profits. They have some profits. They have 20 points in, 25 points in. But because this is a relatively, in my mind, weak move, and it's also one where this is a factor. Now, what factor is this? Um, we use Bloomberg here, if, if that's an answer to one of the comments there. Um, this is another factor mitigating this particular factor here. Okay, look. This line here, is there, there's that old, come on, computer. That, that line from the, the, the idea from the cliche of the markets, gaps will be filled. This move is essentially a gap. It moved up very, very quickly. Remember, this is an hourly chart, but if you put a minute chart up there, you don't show many obstacles. I don't want to put it up because it's a 30-minute chart. Excuse me. Um, it wouldn't show many more prices. Okay, take a look at the minute chart. Let me let me actually do it on another page. Okay, I'm going to choose the minute chart, and we'll put a few days on it. So we uh, let's use the three minute because we're not we're not going to get enough uh, enough moves on it, enough days on it. Sorry. Okay, it doesn't want to do it. I want to get back. I want to get back to the 18th. Um, let's see if we can get on the 15-minute chart. It's today, the 24th. Okay, okay. This is a 15-minute chart, so you can see um, here that we have about 15 minutes, about 45 minutes on this move right here. Okay, if you looked at the minute chart or the tick chart, I think you'd see a much quicker move. Um, either that way. When you get a move this rapidly through any price area, it means there's very little dealing there. That means there's very little resistance or support when you go back to that level because nobody dealt there. One of the things that, that forms resistance and support lines is that people commit themselves to positions there. And so they both think that it's important and they have actual positions based on that. And they won't execute until it, they won't reverse the position until it goes through. That didn't happen here. Because of this rapid move, there are very few moves here. That gives a bias for moving back through this level. It doesn't mean it will happen. And as you can see here, you got a bounce here, but it was not a strong bounce. It was 20 points. That's not a strong bounce. My guess is that as we move, and now, as we move into the New York afternoon, some of this right here is going to end up with profits. People are going to cut. When they see it's not going higher, they'll start cutting their positions. So that bias is one here. The bias from this is something which is, in my mind, inhibiting what we have here. Okay, so we have this here now on the daily chart. and I mean, on the, the hourly, so this is a 30-minute, as a place to go along. That is something which I think is very accurate. Okay, as far as intraday trading goes. Now let's take a look at the daily chart to see if it gives us any support along those lines. Okay, now, let me go get a little bit more here. Let's take six months on this. Okay, so this is the, right here, sorry. This is the, chart line we, we had up we had put up earlier okay on the daily it looks there now can we see any other formations that might reinforce this particular point here as a specific place 
to go long for a longer move rather than an intraday move. I don't think we did it. Let's draw some lines and see. Okay, we've got this one here, this line here. Okay, that's good. We can probably hook up a, probably, but I'm sure we can, a channel based on it. We'll hook up that one here, and then we'll run the channel here. Okay, it gives us some indication of what might be going on up above. But neither one of these lines, this support down here, or this one right here, gives us any real sense of this point being at all part of a larger trend. Now, it is, I suppose, as long as it stays between these two points, but only points which are very far away. So we don't have anything there. Let's go back to look at this. Another key formation that's going to be very difficult to form here, um, because, one, these lines are kind of short, meaning that the time frame is kind of short. I know I'm probably not going to get to all these currencies today, but I know I'm not going to. But the, the thought process that I'm going through here is what I'm trying to illustrate, and it applies to any currency. Um, so maybe what we'll do next time is we will – I'm doing two – I usually do two webinars a month. That will actually go through some of the specific – currencies um, in a quicker fashion now that I've got the basics on how I think about charting down. So we could look for a pennant formation here, but I don't think we're going to find it. But let's just take a look. We have a small top here, and we have this coming down here. So you have sort of a pennant formation here. All a pennant formation really is is a decrease in volatility. It means that the Market is really not making up its mind about which way to go. Traders aren't making up their mind which way to go. Pennants always break. If they point down, generally it goes down. If they point up, generally it goes up. Again, the idea being that traders make their decisions based on the same assumptions, the same information, and very much a generalized type of analysis. Your mind, your purpose, your goal as a trader is to put yourself in line with the majority, to participate in that move and take your profits, uh, cut your losses down. Okay, let's take a look here. Now, where we put a – this is a 30-minute chart. So we put an order here at 65. This is very easy, so I'm going to go very quickly. Where would you put a take profit? Well, if you're long here at 65 – my guess is you're going to look something like this. Perhaps you have a bit of a downward move here. Nothing serious. Whoops. Sorry. As I said, this. Let's see if I can move this. No. Just erase it and start over. Sorry. Okay. So then you take this here. And you get this coming back down here. You could do it like that. But anyway, you're going to move your profits. There isn't, we looked at the longer-term charts. There isn't any sense in charting um, for what we looked at here. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that there is any big move pending here. So you're going to look for intraday profits. If you're going to look for profits, I wouldn't be any more. I don't think it goes back to 35. I would say two reasons for that. One, because you've got this downtrend here, and two, Everybody's going to be looking to take profits. We know we've got this weighing on the mines here, and this is just not a strong move. So my guess is we get profits somewhere between 90 and the figure, and I wouldn't look for any more. You're not making a lot of points on this, but there isn't a lot of move here. So profit taking somewhere above 90 is what I would look for. Now, you get developments out there, news, whatever, that's fine. Um, you get anything, you get a rush and a break of the old high at 60, you're lucky, take your profits. Where do you put a stop? That's obviously, again, pretty easy. You look somewhere below the line. Okay, there's nothing particularly revelatory about anything I've said as far as these goes. But for this type of trade, you have to take what the market will give you, and that's all there is to it. If you manage to get, get high, I mean, to get long at 60 or 65, that's fine. Okay, let me, t let me speak a little bit. We're getting toward the end here, so let me speak a little bit about some of the other indicators that I use in the way that I look at them. Most of the indicators um, 
are based, not all of them, but most of them are based on the principle of reversion to the mean. That's all they are. RS, the ones that are up there, RSI, Stochastics, Mac, Stochastic, Smart, MACD, and many of the others, they chart, they don't, I don't think they use significant, um, significant difference from the mean, but that's what they chart. So yes, they will tell you absolutely when the price movement is at a standard, I don't think they use standard deviations, you can chart them in that, um, from the mean, but that's all they are. So it's useful in giving you that information. It's also useful in that everyone has their favorites. And so if you look at charting on this, and you also, so let's take a look at what we would get. Now, we don't want to use, I would not use the indicators on a 30-minute chart. I, in my personal view, don't think that's particularly useful. But let's take a look. I, I think the indicators are much more, especially since they tend to be they're a reversion to the mean. They need a longer time to work. Well, let's take a look. Okay, let's take a look at one of them and see what we get. Again, the same idea. Uh, let's use, let's see, let's use RSI. RSI, I used to use RSI. Okay, I think, I don't th I think 14 days is too short on this. Um, I would probably use a 55 on this. Okay, so this is RSI. And what is it telling us? That relative to this period here, it is relatively. So anyway, RSI gives you a overbought signal. Exactly what we'd expect from this type of chart with this type of display. So it doesn't tell anyone information that they really don't have already, which is why I'm kind of less... Uh, I, I use indicators largely as referral points. What they do is they reinforce the types of things that I think are depicted in the charts, and they leave it at that. Now, let's take an even longer view on this to look for some what might be a significant type of break where you can – Look for a trend reversal. Now, the problem with looking for trend reversals right now is that we are very much in a central bank-driven world. This and this here, these are central bank moves. So it's difficult, more difficult than usual, to base your information and your trading information on any particular long-term trend. Okay, um, I'm being told I have to wrap up here. Um, I will. So let me just, I have probably about another minute. Take a look at this chart here. This is a year in the euro. Where would we look for any particular long-term trend? They're actually, the longest-term trend we've got, <coughs> excuse me, we have, is from February until, what date is this? That's three months, not even, two months, from February to April. Compare that to the, pull up a Euro-Yen chart and take it back to the, earth, to the last decade. You're looking at a chart that goes on for years. Okay, folks, um, I'm going to consider how to, um, to uh, I think maybe we have some interest in this, despite some of the comments, what can I say? Um, and, and to see how to continue this um, next time. If anyone finds this approach, and I agree, it's not a traditional approach to charting, but very little I do is particularly traditional. I did not come to this uh, career in a traditional fashion. Um, Anyway, I thank you all very much for participating. There will be, I appreciate the participation.
on the uh, webinar in the chat very much. I also very much appreciate your your attending. I take it as a great compliment that anyone would that you would come and listen to what I have to say. Um, so I will see you again next month. Again, I thank you all very much. I will put my email address up there. If anyone would like to send me comments, criticisms, or anything else, please do. Again, thank you very much, and have a lovely day today, folks.